好的，呃，主持的时候我会使用中文，<笑>谢谢大家。那下一个讲者是我们来自 s v i c Tech 多伦多的一个多伦多公民科技五年之后再五年的一个 session。那呃，这两位讲者他们是在多伦多这边，其实长期就是呃。这就是在参与他们那边的公民科技社群。那其实他跟 GDV 也有蛮多的渊源，像之前呃以前呃 GDV 曾经有有到那边去做演讲，然后跟交流。所以像呃。c o 呃，那个 Civic Tech Toronto， 他们其实就有一个人叫 Parkon， 他就来到台湾这边，在 g l v 这边待了三个月左右，然后也带了一些东西回去，那彼此交流。所以今天的两位，一位是 Curtis， 那他是一个就是呃博士生啊，他对公民科技这边就是呃有蛮深的投入。那另外一位是 Sky Draw。对，那他是呃公务员的身份，但是他也是呃致力在就是怎么样让呃公民科技这些工具能够能够进到政府里面，那也是提供更好的一些公共服务。那我们欢迎他们。Uh, hello, bonjour, miao. I am Curtis McCord. I am a、uh, PhD candidate at the University of Toronto. I study civic tech in Toronto. And for the last year, I've been、uh, on the organizing team of Civic Tech Toronto. Hi everyone, my name is Skydra. I work as a public servant by day at the Ontario Digital Service for the province of Ontario, and by night, I've also been helping out as a co-organizer with Civic Tech Toronto for more or less the last year. So. We are more than happy to have been accepted and joining you all here. And before we get started, we just like to acknowledge that we are traditionally、um, where we are gathering from, where we're where we're tuning in from. So traditionally, Toronto was a gathering place for many nations, including the Anishinaabeg, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. We acknowledge we are presenting from the area covered by Treaty 13, also known as the Toronto Purchase, and we pay our respects to the Mississaugas of the Credit. So, what is Civic Tech Toronto? We have been convening a community of designers, of technologists, of of Toronto citizens, of anyone and everyone who's interested in civic tech issues since 2015. We are 100% volunteer-run community. We have、um, been going strong for the last five years, recruiting and encouraging speakers and. 10-minute, more or less, spotlight presentations on a variety of topics that face issues、um, that are prominent in the Toronto,、uh, the Toronto ecosystem, but also how they intersect with policy and technology,、um, and justice and democracy. We are a space. We're a space that cooperates and experiments with making technology work and have it be designed with and for citizens. And lately, we've been meeting on online. We have a huge Slack community where many of our community members collaborate asynchronously throughout the week. And ultimately, we're an umbrella of connections and resources here to amplify a variety of projects. We thought we'd start by getting into five memorable hack nights to shed a bit of history on the evolution of our community. Then we want to get into five civic issues that are facing Toronto and how it's really had an impact on the projects coming out of our of our community. And finally, want to leave you with five thoughts that we're we're reckoning with、um, heading into our future, all in the banner of fives to celebrate five years and five years onward. Curtis. When Civic Tech Toronto started in 2015, it was a group of public servants, activists, developers, and consultants that were interested in taking concepts from design, technology development, policy making, and urban planning, and combining them in ways that were new and interesting to build a community. Civic Tech Toronto was built, at least in part, to create and sustain a network, this kind of network of people who were interested in the intersection between government and technology. The Hack Nights are where Civic Tech Toronto comes together to、uh, to grow and、uh, maintain this network by exposing our participants to new ideas, by giving people a chance to discuss and to collaborate, and to legitimate what would become an emerging social world where people could talk about how tech and design could improve government and city life using a new kind of language that would blend a lot of different expertises together. And make things a more、uh, and show what really a lot of these different areas had in common. 
this was done by building a hack night that served uh, to allow people to hack on projects every week uh, over time, and by inviting speakers who could act as champions for civic tech in Toronto, lending their influence and voice to the community. Jennifer Hollett, for example, is a prominent media personality and tech activist, and she supported the community from the start, sharing our values and helping to build the movement. In 2016, she spoke at Civic Tech Toronto's 36th Hack Night, about a new app she was working on that helped to shed some light on campaign finance practices. And it was alongside speakers like Jennifer that our community was able to bring people together from many different fields for discussion and collaboration. 2017 was also a really big year for Civic Tech in Toronto. Founders of Civic Tech Toronto, working in collaboration with public service, started Code for Canada, a national non-for-profit that helps governments to better address issues of tech and design and acts as a sort of steward for the civic tech movement in Canada. Civic tech groups have been started in cities like Edmonton, Vancouver, Ottawa, Moncton, and just this year a new civic tech group started running hack nights in Montreal. In 2017, Civic Tech Toronto also had its most well-attended hack night, hosted by the government of Ontario, and we welcomed the new chief digital officer, Hilary Hartley, whose commitment to user-centered design and agile development was a big shakeup in the way that governments usually approach technology development. Founders of Civic Tech Toronto gone on to become founders of the Ontario Digital Service, a new branch of government that would be focused on designing and redesigning government services and assets with an in-house technological capacity that was previously unimagined. This was in many ways a watershed moment for the civic tech community in Toronto and legitimated our community and gave birth to a whole new set of opportunities in government and beyond. Code for Canada continues to work to integrate tech and design expertise with government through their annual fellowship program and their civic hall, which retrains and mentors public servants to learn about the state of the art civic tech methods. In 2018, members of the GovZero community paid Toronto a visit for RightsCon and stopped by a Civic Tech Toronto hack night to give a presentation. At Massey College at the University of Toronto, TTCAT described a bottom-up approach to civic tech that was rooted in radical transparency, activism, and a lot of expertise. I, who was among the participants, was greatly moved by experiences of the occupation of Parliament and the struggle of GovZero Gov and a, great, a broader coalition to bring transparency to governments in Taiwan. I felt that the values animating GovZero were very similar to those that I recognized in Civic Tech Toronto at the time. We too were committed to making technology that could serve democracy and to engaging more and more people, especially non-experts, in discussions of design and policy. We are both communities run from the bottom up, relying on the entrepreneurial impulses of our members and the generosity of our volunteers. In many ways, this encounter was merely the beginning of a relationship. Later, Civic Tech Toronto organizer Patrick Patcon Connolly would complete a fellowship working with GovZero and his inspirations would find their way into or our organization as well. Since then, GovZero celebrities like Audrey Tang have returned to Toronto numerous times to speak and there is consistently reference to GovZero and VTaiwan as inspirational examples of what our community could accomplish. The fall of 2019, we had Sam Jeffers uh, visit us, who was joined in Toronto because of a visiting fellowship through the Ryerson uh, Leadership Lab uh, through an institution that is based in Toronto. And so this particular hack night drew a lot of interest from the broader community and, in and allied communities that support civic tech. His project specifically that he was highlighting and sharing was Who Targets Me, which was started up roughly around the time of the UK elections in 2017 as a way to um, target uh, political ads that were being run on, on social media and to raise awareness and really fueled by a concern about the intersection of and, and potentially the disruption of democracy and digital technology. And um, Sam Jeffers, uh, at the very beginning of the Hack Night, I was there and I thought, found this very memorable, actually gave a shout out to the civic tech community and the civic tech ecosystem and made time to attend this Hack Night specifically because for for him and his and his colleagues um, and collaborators, it was actually civic tech hack nights that uh, gave shape to this project and his ambitions. And finally, um, our our fifth our fifth and and very memorable hack night was uh, our very special hack night. We wanted to find a way to 
uh, me like memorialize all of the accomplishments of this community. And we had to do this in a distributed way. It was a chaotic time, but we're, we're so grateful that we were able to reach out to our vibrant and very accomplished alumni list and all of our previous sponsors who had hosted us, uh, giving us access to spaces to have hack nights. And through much deliberation, we came to uh, three speakers that we felt had really sort of not only um, represented a kind of past, present and future of civic tech, but also really embody the values of the community. Nazma Ahmed, who is a prominent figure in Toronto for her ability to artfully weave uh, justice conversations with technology and, and digital policy, and also through her founding of the Digital Justice Lab. Jennifer Holland, I was mentioned earlier, um, and again, continues to be a huge amplifier and ally for all things civic tech. And Delaney Kurukula, who is uh, a co-organizer of Civic Tech Toronto, but also leads her own project, The Accelerator, which um, Curtis is going to shed light on in just a moment. And so now we're going to branch off to really get into five civic issues facing Toronto and how they've been, how the Civic Tech Toronto has responded and dovetailed into them and to addressing them. In the last decades, Toronto has become more prosperous, more populous, and more expensive. In this part, this is exactly because of Toronto's success in attracting technology companies and skilled labor. But this has changed our city in a lot of ways, and now gentrification and a lack of housing options have led to crises in affordability and housing. At Civic Tech Toronto, numerous projects, including Ample Labs, Shalmers Card, and Tech Mentoring TO have formed to address these issues of homelessness in our city in a variety of ways. Using Civic Tech to build momentum, Ample Labs has become a not-for-profit technology company that provides a chatbot service, Chalmers, to regional authorities and aims to help people experiencing homeless or other precarious, uh, precarious situations to access resources like food banks and shelters through an easy-to-use text, uh, text chat interface rather than having them sift through pages of differently uh, different Google documents or uh, websites. Where there's no smartphones, there's still wood, and the laser-cut Chalmers cards were created to be a durable artifact specific to Toronto, artifacts that could be passed between different people and would always carry the most valuable information to them. Last but certainly not least, Toronto Tech Mentoring, a project formerly known as Accelerator, has been partnering with local outreach groups to offer mentoring and tech education to precarious youth, aiming to equip themselves with skills for the employment market. Accelerator has been a great example of how projects at Civic Tech can scale in a way that's slow and deliberate, partnering with other organizations to create a meaningful impact in the city. Diversity and inclusion in the tech community. You don't have to venture very far to realize that there is a very stark problem. At, and tech meetups in the tech ecosystem there are voices that are not being elevated and heard. And so one huge problem that has been surfaced continuously um, at the Civic Tech Hack Nights is this idea of representation and inclusion. And one particular project that got its foot is women and color. And um, it's really been focused on sort of three main goals. One is to connect unserved, underserved voices to opportunities to have uh, platform speaking opportunities in the Toronto tech system, but also more broadly. Um, secondly, it's also to build a platform that is dedicated exclusively to recruiting and connecting opportunities to these underserved voices. And thirdly, it's finding ways to scale. And this particular project has come to Civita Toronto on multiple accounts, um, but even in the way that we or self organize our community, we're mindful of who we uh, invite who we collaborate with um, and how we amplify a variety of voices. It's really, really core to the values and the way we structure the Civic Tech Toronto community. Integrating citizen input into municipal processes has been a continual struggle in Toronto, but some projects at Civic Tech have specifically selected municipal government, municipal infrastructure as their site of inter intervention. I'll briefly draw attention to two right now. The Toronto City budget is an extremely complicated object, with information spread in a decentralized manner throughout different departments and services. 
If one wanted to see how the city allocated their budget resources, this was nearly impossible without extensive research. Enter Budgetpedia, an early project at Civic Tech Toronto that sought to aggregate and centralize budget information while providing users with visualizations to aid their analysis and a host of educational resources to allow users to engage with the budget. Bike Space, on the other hand, was created in a partnership between Code for Canada, Civic Tech Toronto, the City of Toronto, and Cycle Toronto, a local nonprofit advocating for cyclists and cycling infrastructure. Bike Space allows users, through the use of an app, to identify damage or inefficiencies in the city's bike parking infrastructure. And most importantly, it's been integrated into the city's ticketing system so that public works employees are monitoring the app to know what they have to do. Contributing back to a software commons, the software is, avail uh, is available on GitHub and is also in use by the city of Edmonton. Designing access to legal rights. I think many people in Toronto and more broadly can agree that there are problems with the way that the justice system information is, is outlined. And there's really a need to be user-centered, engage citizens, develop legal capabilities, have strong data practices and innovate by working across disciplines. And so there is a, also an, another project that got its foot in the Civic Tech Toronto Hack Night space, uh, Law and Design Collab. And um, I think what, what we think is really interesting about this project in particular and how they've been addressing this issue of access to legal rights and legal information is um, firstly how they're, how they're set up. So um, a lot of it is, is takes, in, takes the modeling from Civic Tech Toronto. It's a very decentralized um, approach. It allows for the inflow of volunteers and supporters. There's an executive team that's then focused on specific projects and they branch out and then they go back into the ecosystem and it kind of continues on. And it's also trying to bring in a more provocative and um, design focused communications approach to getting the word out. Um, lately, the, the, the team has also been uh, really, really ramping up their um, contribution to uh, creative media in the advocacy space writ large in Toronto and more broadly. And finally, we're really encouraged to see that even though the Civic Tech Toronto community is not meeting in person, people are really, project groups are really taking advantage of the digital infrastructure. So our Slack community and their their weekly standups and their weekly meetings are actually run through and promoted through the Law and Design Collab open shared Slack space. So anyone can join the Civic Tech Toronto Slack community, but also anyone can peek into this particular project group and openly witness their progress, drop in a few questions or comments. It's really kind of a neat um, inception of projects within projects happening. Started in 2016 at Civic Tech Toronto, Toronto Mesh continues to exist as a collective of Toronto residents, be they former, current, or occasional residents, interested in experimenting and advocating for the use of alternative networking technologies and infrastructures to deliver internet access in Toronto and around the world. Working for over a year at Civic Tech Toronto, they began to operate more independently once their onboarding became uh, onboarding in a limited time time became difficult. But working alongside other groups like Freenet Toronto, R Networks, Free Geek, uh, and Hack Lab TO, Toronto Mesh continues to advocate for resilience in community owned networks, presenting a new paradigm of internet access that is free of centralized control and more responsive to local needs. They experiment with hardware, designing nodes with Orange Pi computers, and software playing a role in the development of the Interplanetary File System, IPFS. And besides deployments, they're working on building out their capacity for community outreach and education. Now, during the pandemic, Toronto Mesh is making great strides to create a network that covers the city, leveraging their connections to place super nodes on tower buildings and smaller nodes to propagate the network. So where do we go from here? Um, we have lots of questions, but I think we've been able to, as a co-organizing team, consolidate them into five top thoughts that we think are gonna be leading us into hopefully sustaining the community for another five years and beyond. Firstly, it's acknowledging that tech is in the silver bullet. And I think many groups that are pivoting right now can acknowledge that this is exactly the case. Tech is a part of the solution. It's a tool in a broader toolkit, but tech 
solutionism is not going to solve your problems. You really have to get down to the civic issue. And that's why it's called civic tech. We often say 90% civic, 10% tech integration. Secondly, it's creating space for tough conversations and acknowledging that we're now also having to deliberate and collaborate and build projects in distributed times. And that's going to take a lot of work. And thirdly, partnerships for impactful interventions. How are we, what are our partners going to look like in the future? How are we going to partner together, amplify one another? Big question at the back of our minds. Fourthly, moving beyond Zoom, really trying to not only um, understand how we work, but also how we infuse culture and get people excited about joining this community, making it fun and enjoyable. And finally, where civic tech is actually going to fit into Canada and beyond. What's the next form? What's it going to look like? Where do we go from here? Thanks for listening to us today. Uh, thanks for listening to our stories. We hope you like them. We'd love to hear your stories too. We'd love to connect with you. So please keep in touch. You can find us on Meetup, on Twitter. You can join our Slack. And you can come by a hack night any Tuesday from 7 to 9. Uh, we're really interested in hearing what you have to say. And we're very happy to take questions uh, as soon as I press this button. We are very thankful to Curtis and uh, SkyDraw. Although they are not able to come to the stage, but he will finish the third session after the third session. He will finish the third session after the third session. He will finish the third session after the third session. He will finish the third session after the third session. He will finish the third session after the third session. He will finish the third session after the third session. He will finish the third session after the third session. He will finish the third session after the third session. He will finish the third session after the third session. He will finish the third session after the third session. He will finish the third session after the third session. He will finish the third session after the third session. He will finish the third session after the third session. He will finish the 在 Jimmy 的 Slack 里面的话，那其实之前呃，大概去年左右就会发现，突然变了，突然增加了很多 General 的，就是各国语言的翻译的，就是频道、喔。那其实就是 Park 康他想要更了解台湾，但是他又觉得大家好像不应该为了他讲英文，所以他就做了就是自动翻译，能够把 General 频道的。文字翻成英文的其他的频道，然后让其他外国对台湾 G N V 非常有兴趣的朋友，也能够透过 Slack 更了解，就是台湾的呃 C V Tech 在做什么。